All right, Esther chapter 6. I think um, one of the main topics we're going to get out of this chapter is how everything happens in God's timing. I've already made mention of this before, but chapter 6 is kind of like the ultimate chapter now of, of just building everything up to where, you know, everything's going to fall apart for Haman. So up to this point, there's been a lot of different events that have happened and interesting things that have happened. And this is kind of the final chapter that, that still is building, 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 building everything up before that great fall of, of Haman and, and where everything's going to, really all the wrongs are going to be made right. And we're going to see, um, you know, how, how the rest of the chapter or how the rest of the book and the story just, just plays out after this. But let's get started here in Esther chapter 6, verse number 1, the Bible reads, On that night could not the king sleep. So if you remember, just to bring you up to speed real quick, um, just from chapter 5, not through the whole book. But um, Queen Esther was going to make the request or her petition unto the king and basically tell the king of what's happened with, uh, with Haman. And that Haman had, had made this decree to kill all the Jews and that she was going to be killed with them. Right? And she... so. She's, she's going to ask the king and request for her life and the life of her people and, and that, that he would prevent this from happening and allow this not to go forward and, and just to basically offer some help in that regard as well as to just expose Haman to the king and how wicked he is and what he was trying to do. So in chapter 5 though, she was, you know, she asked him to go to this banquet and then they go to the banquet and then she says, okay, well, uh, how about you come to the banquet that I'm going to prepare for you tomorrow, and then I'm going to tell you what, you know, what, what, what my petition is, what my request is. So she kind of pushes it off an extra day, and, and it went over this last week how, you know, we don't know what's going on inside of her. Maybe it's her nerves. Maybe she's just not bold enough at the time to, to, to actually come forward and say what she needs to say. Whatever it is in, in, in her own eyes or in her own mind, we're going to see here, especially as you get into chapter 7, but chapter 6 leading up to this, this is all happening in God's timing. This is all happening according to God's will. Because if she had said everything she wanted to say the day prior, none of these events that we're reading about in chapter 6 would happen and would happen the way they were. And, and the, 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 the full force and effect of what Esther is going to reveal to the king wouldn't be nearly as severe as it is after we see what happens in chapter 6. So in chapter 6 now, it's, it's the night before that banquet where Esther's going to expose Haman unto uh, King Ahasuerus. And the king, all of a sudden, for some reason, he's not able to sleep. Right? He's having problems falling asleep, which again, I would say that's probably of the Lord as well, that he's having a hard time getting rest that night. So what he does is he calls in you know, his servants or whatever to, to bring in the book of the records, and he just wants to hear some of the stories of things that have, that have been recorded in the history of, of their city there. It says he commanded to bring the book of records of the, excuse me, of the Chronicles, and they were read before the king. It's kind of like the news. Right, but he's going back and he's just he's just like hearing like these old news from the kingdom, and they're reading this stuff to him uh, just because he can't sleep. So he's he figures why not? Um, you know, he can't turn on the TV, so he's listening to to these old stories. And then in verse two, it says, "And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Tiresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hand on the king as wears." And we read about this a couple chapters ago. How these, these two chamberlains, they're, they're plotting and planning to do evil against the king. Mordecai catches wind of it because he's kind of working there in the gate. He hears it, he overhears it, and he reports them so that they're not able to do harm to the king. And then in verse 3, so when the king hears this news and he's like, wow, that, like, I didn't even know that happened. So what, so what ended up happening with this? You know, this Mordecai fella, he, you know, he kind of saved me. He, 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 made the, he made people aware that these people were going to do harm. He says in verse 3, And the king said, What honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, There is nothing done for him. So they're saying, well, no one did anything for him. Basically, he's just not recognized at all for the good that he had done and for saving the king's life and, you know, reporting these people. Now, 
we've already mentioned this, and Mordecai is one of the characters in this story whose, whose symbolic role doesn't really change. You know, we kind of look at King Ahasuerus can, can kind of wear different hats depending on, on the context of the story, on who he's representative of. But Mordecai is his representative of a good, godly man, just a, a good Christian man and, and exhibits the, the traits and the characteristics that we would want to emulate in our own lives. And this trait of, and to keep your place here in Esther chapter 6, turn if you would to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, of doing what's right and working hard regardless of the recognition, right? Regardless of who sees, regardless of, of who's going to reward you, who's watching, who's going to do good to you. You know, you don't just do good and do right because, oh, well, I'm expecting to get a reward. You do good and you do right because it's right. You do good and, and you, you have integrity of heart and you do your job and you do your job well because it's the right thing to do. And we know, being children of God, that God will recompense us. Just when we sow good, we're going to reap good. The Bible tells us and teaches very clearly that you're going to reap what you sow. When you're doing evil and you're sowing wickedness, well, you know what? That wickedness is going to come back to you and you're going to receive of that wickedness, you know, way more than even what, you, what you'd sown and what you planted. But when you're doing good, it's going to come back to you as well. But we need to make sure that we could maintain patience and not get upset, not have a bad attitude. And Mordecai, is, you know, he didn't go, oh, well, you know, I saved the king's life, so what's going to be done for me, huh? Well, I guess I'm not just going to do my job then, because forget it, if they're not even going to recognize the job that I'm doing, then forget that. But how many times have you been on the job at work and you have people with that same exact stinking attitude? Right? Oh, well, I spent extra time and I did this and I did that and no one's even recognizing that I did anything, so I'm not going to put in any more effort for them anymore. Right? Now, I'll tell you this right now. Nobody wants to work with those types of people. Yeah. Amen. Nobody does. Because that type of an attitude, one, it's contagious. It's going it's to just bring other people down. It's going to cause other people not to work as hard. And it's going to, if it causes you not to work as hard, you know what? Shame on you. Because here's what the Bible teaches about how we ought to work. In Ephesians chapter 6, look at verse number 5. The Bible says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. Now, don't get caught up in the terminology servants and masters. Because... All this is saying is when you're subordinate to someone and you're serving them or working for them, you can be called their servant. So if you have a boss, if you go to, to, a, to a place of business or you go to work and you have somebody that's your manager, supervisor, someone who has authority over you in a workplace, well, your job is to serve them because they're telling you what you need to do. So you're a servant and they're the master because they're the one running things or operating things or in charge. This isn't talking about just like being some slave or something. This is talking about servants and masters, people who are in authority versus people who are not in authority. If you're doing work for someone, you're a servant. And in the most simple terms, if you go out to a restaurant, who comes to your table? You know, they used to be called waiters and waitresses. Now they're called servers. Right? What are they doing? They're serving you. They're serving you food. They're serving you what you want. It's a servant. There's nothing wrong or demeaning about it. It's just a job, right? So what the Bible's teaching here, it says, servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Or excuse me, I'm, I'm looking at Colossians. Right? I, have, I have both references here. Colossians 3, Ephesians chapter 6 are parallel uh, on this subject. It says, servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart, look at this, as unto Christ. So the Bible teaches us that when we go to work and you have a job to do and you have someone that's over you, that has authority over you, that you're supposed to work and you're supposed to listen to them and you're supposed to do your job as unto Christ. I mean, think about the job that you would do if instead of your boss being the one telling you what to do, it was Christ. How good of a job would you want to do then? And, and you know, maybe your job is to clean toilets. 
Maybe that's your job. Hey, I've had that job before. It's work. Maybe that's your job. Maybe it's a real humble job. But if Jesus Christ is the one saying, hey, I need you to clean that toilet, how good of a job do you want to do for him? If he's telling you to do something, I mean, I would think that you'd want to do the best you can. Hey, this is, this is, this is great. This is clean. Instead of just cutting corners, going, eh, well, good enough. I don't care. Whatever. I don't like that job anyways. It's a lot easier to have that type of an attitude towards someone that's just your boss, right? Especially if your boss is someone who you don't really like or maybe they don't treat you very well. But here's what the Bible teaches about that is that regardless of whether or not your boss teach, you know, treats you well, you still need to do your job as if you're serving Christ. Now, the Bible also teaches that the masters are supposed to treat people well, treat the servants well. and you know, That's on them. But as with everything in life, you don't control what other people do. You control what you do. So whether it be a marriage, whether you're a child, whether you're a parent, whether you're a boss, whether you're a servant, whatever role you're in, you can't do wrong on your job because someone else isn't doing their job. The wife can't, can't say, well, I'm not going to be a godly wife because my husband is a jerk to me. And the husband can't say, well, I'm not going to be a good godly husband because my wife just doesn't listen and does this. You, know, you can't do that. I mean, that, not in God's eyes. He's going to say, no, you do what you're supposed to do. You've got a job to do. You work. You work hard. How about this? How about you have a good testimony as someone who works hard and doesn't just try to find every way to, to skip out on work and, and take every break that you possibly can and, and cut corners and then, and then tell people, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian, by the way. Yeah, I follow Christ. Let's make sure that we can, you know, have a good testimony with the integrity of our heart that if people are going to understand and know, yeah, you're a Christian, hey, I, you know what? I might have guessed that because I could see how hard you work. I could see that no matter what the job is, you're willing to do it and you're going to spend the extra time and you're going to do it right and you're not going to work. Look at verse number six. Not with eye service as men pleasers. And you know the type. There's a type of people that are only going to work when someone's watching them. Oh, wait, hey, hey, the boss is here. Look busy and they're going to be all busy and look real fast. They're like, oh man, look how good I'm doing. And then as soon as they turn the corner and walk away, it's... Right? That's a man pleaser. That's eye service. That's just, I'm only going to do good so that when someone's looking at me, then they could think I'm doing a good job. You need to be... It says, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. You're going to do the right thing. You're going to work hard because that's just what you need to do. And it doesn't matter who's watching. You could be the only one on a Saturday or whatever at work and doing a job and no one's going to know and no one's going to see, but you're going to do it anyway because you've got a job to do. And you know what? Who sees in the end? God sees that. God sees the work that you do and God knows your heart and God will see if you are working as unto Christ at whatever it is that you're doing, you have a master over you and you're just a servant, he's going to see your hard work and he will bless you for it. And you say, well, no one's recognizing me. I'm not getting any appreciation, so why should I work so hard? Because God sees what you do. Because ultimately, God will bless you for what you do. The Bible says in verse 7, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. It doesn't matter what your position is. It doesn't matter what your status is. If you can do what's right, and if you can just do that good job, and you can focus on, you know what, this is what the position I'm in, this is a job I need to do, and I'm going to serve as if I'm serving Christ. I'm going to do the best job I possibly can. Even if people don't recognize it, even if people don't reward you for it, even if people aren't giving you the credit you deserve, God's going to see it, and you know what, eventually you will get blessed by him, and you will get paid by him. But you know what, it's going to be on God's time, not on your time. So, 
Sometimes that may translate into earthly blessings of you working real hard, not getting recognition for it, and then just later on down the road, God ends up blessing you in a way that you never would have thought because you're working with signals of heart as unto the Lord. Or if you don't receive any earthly blessing, right? Then you know that he's going to reward you at the judgment seat of Christ. Either way, you're going to get blessed by the Lord because he, he makes sure he is the ultimate just judge. And when he sees the work you're doing and he sees the effort you're putting forth, he will make sure that you end up getting what's right. And I would go further to say that even on top of that, God blesses more than what we might consider would be right. Just because he's a generous and a loving God. I'm not saying it's not right. I'm just saying that, that God gives a lot. And this is exactly what Mordecai did. Now here we see this, and, and we don't know exactly the time frame, you know, of how long it's been since he did what was right. But you know what? He continued to do his job. He continued to be at the gate. He continued to serve the king. Even after that whole thing happened and he didn't get any recognition and no one did anything for him. Well, you know what? Now something is going to be done for him. Now he is going to get recognized. We don't see any evidence of him complaining or not, you know, not doing anything he's supposed to do. We see him doing exactly what he's supposed to be doing. And the Bible says that that's how we ought to be. Let's go back to Esther chapter 6. Now, the timing of the book of Esther is amazing for this because we saw in chapter 5 that he was advised by his wife and his friends to make a gallows for Mordecai. Because Mordecai is the one who wouldn't bow down to wicked Haman. Because he's not going to bow down to any man because he's going to bow down to the Lord only. He's going to worship and serve God and not worship man. So again, with integrity of heart, he's saying, nope, I don't care if it's the law. I don't care what you're going to do. I'm not going to bow down to you because I'm not going to worship man. I'm going to worship God. And that drove uh, Haman nuts to the point where he wants to kill him. And he makes that whole decree, which we already know about. And to the point where, you know, he's not, we saw last week, he's not happy with any of his wealth. He's not happy with how many kids, he's not happy over all the blessings in his life. His status, his position, he's the number two man. He's got all these kids, he's got all this wealth. And he says, none of it matters as long as Mordecai is still alive. So to fix his problem, he's like, you know what? We're going to build a gallows. And a gallows is something that's, that's made to hang someone on, right? To put them to death, to execute them. And it was built specifically for Mordecai. Now, the king didn't know what a great guy Mordecai was just inherently, necessarily, right? So if Esther would have brought up these things or if the timing didn't happen quite the way that it does, it wouldn't have the same impact that it ends up having in this story. But see, the king, he's not able to sleep. So now he just happens to hear this particular story about Mordecai, right, by coincidence, which isn't a coincidence, that now he hears, hey, Mordecai, we need to do something for this. He, he saved my life. And he wasn't even rewarded. He wasn't recognized for it. So now his time's going to come due to be recognized for that. At the same time, now the king's heart is going to be more towards Mordecai, like, He's not a wicked person at all. The king can see that and he knows that Mordecai's not wicked. Mordecai doesn't have it out for the king. Mordecai doesn't have any ill will because if he did, he wouldn't have said anything. He would have allowed the plans to go through. But instead, nope, he spoke up. He did something about it. He stopped evil from happening to the king, which proves that he didn't have anything, you know, negative against the king. So even if Haman were to try to say, oh, you understand this Mordecai, he's a wicked guy and he wants, you know, he's not going to believe him because now he's heard this story. So now at the same time, he just hears this story. The king says, who's in the court? In verse number four, Haman showing up 
basically to ask the king so to, to tell about Mordecai so that he could get the okay to hang him on the gallows at his house after the king just hears about this story. We talk about timing, right? Who is in the court? Now Haman was come into the outward court of the king's house to speak unto the king to hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. That's why he came. Verse 5. But see, the king, and this is again, God's timing. He doesn't get to even talk to him about that yet. Right? That information isn't known unto the king until later. And, it, and it's amazing how it all fits together. But look at verse number 5. It says, And the king's servants said unto him, Behold, Haman standeth in the court. And the king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in, and the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? Simple question, right? Obviously, the king has it in his mind. Hey, I need to do something for Mordecai. But what should I do? So he doesn't say, he doesn't mention Mordecai, but he says, you know what? I need to honor someone. What do you think I should do? And Haman, because he's so proud and full of himself, of course, can't imagine that anyone else would be worthy of honor but him. And we're going to get a peek into his heart again, into his wicked heart about how full of himself he is. It says, now Haman thought in his heart, to whom would the king delight to do honor more than to myself? Like basically, I mean, pfft, if you're going to honor anyone, <laughs> I mean, of course it's going to be me. Like, who else would get honor? It's got to be me. So now we see what, what Haman's response is. This is what he wants. This is what he really wants to have for himself. Verse number seven, And Haman answered the king, For the man whom the king delighted to honor, let the royal apparel be brought which the king useth to wear. And the horse that the king rideth upon, and the crown royal which is set upon his head, and let this apparel and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that they may array the man withal, whom the king delighted to honor, and bring him on horseback through the street of the city, and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delighted to honor. So what do we see about Haman he wants to be the king. Because, I mean, he's saying, hey, the clothing that the king wears, the crown that's on the king's head, the horse that the king rides, all of that stuff put on this guy. That's who he wants to be. He wants to be like the Most High. And you know who else wants to be like the Most High? Turn to Isaiah chapter 14. We'll see who wants to be like the Most High high. This is what's in the heart of Haman. Isaiah chapter 14. The Bible says in verse number 12 of Isaiah 14, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will, also, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That's Satan. That's Lucifer saying, you know what? I want to be like God. I want to be God. And people get so full of themselves. They think they're so great. They basically want to be God in their own eyes. Just, just man, I, I just, I'm so great. I'm like God. And watch out for these people that, that go around and have that type of an attitude. Like they think they're so great. Like they're this, this, this God. That's how... Um, was it Kanye, Kanye West, right? Those are, those, if you listen to his, to his lyrics and stuff that he goes around saying like, oh, I'm this great Christian, he talks about how he's a God. Right. Yeah. And it's wicked as hell. That's right. yeah. Yeah. Want to be, let's say, satanic. I'm going to be like the most high. No, you're not like the most high. You're not even close to being like the most high. And Haman definitely is not like the most high. But you know what? We see in his heart, 
He just wants to be like the king. Like that's, that's, that's what he wants. Because number two isn't good enough for him. And that was Satan's problem too. God made Satan before his fall. He was, he was the anointed cherub. He had a great position, a prestige among the angels, among, you know, among God's creation. He was very beautiful. He had a great status and position. You know what? That wasn't good enough for him. So pride entered into his heart. And the Bible says that pride goeth before destruction. And a haughty spirit before a fall. And that's where Haman is right now. He is so lifted up and full of himself. I mean, you can't imagine that the king would want to do honor to anybody but him. Oh man, yeah, let this guy be paraded around in all the king's stuff like he's the king. Pride goeth before destruction. And what's, what's great about this is that he ends up now and being on the receiving end and not, and not the way that he wants to be, but the tables get turned on Haman. And this is the beginning of the tables being turned. This is the beginning of the end for Haman. Verse number 10, the Bible reads in, uh, in Esther chapter 6. Go back to Esther chapter 6. The Bible says, Then the king said, un said to Haman, Make haste and take the apparel and the horse as thou hast said. So the king's saying, Hey, it's a great idea. Yeah. Right? Sure, we'll do all that. And do even so to Mordecai the Jew that sitteth at the king's gate. Let nothing fail of all that thou hast spoken. You made his jaws probably be dropped. Like, <laughs> wait, what? <laughs> no, 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 no. You're supposed to be getting someone else to do this to me because, I mean, who, uh, why would you want to honor anyone else? So now everything that came out of his wicked heart, now he's the one that's humiliated. Because you know what? Everybody knows how much he hates Mordecai the Jew. Everyone, everyone, I think, but the king. The king doesn't seem to be really aware of what's going on here uh, personally with Haman. Because he didn't make it personal about him when he went to get the, uh, the authority for that day to, to attack the Jews and to, and to wipe them out and stuff. He just kind of made it more about all the Jews, about all these people. Oh, man, these guys aren't good to be in this kingdom. They're a bunch of troublemakers, right? So... The king doesn't, doesn't put these two together, and he's just like, great, here, yeah. And you know what? Since he was the most respected one, because he said, let, let the, you know, the, the king's top guy basically lead him around, so he's like, there you go. You get to lead him around on the king's horse and the king's apparel and the king's crown, and now you're going to do this. Now, I'm thinking, if I was in Mordecai's shoes, I'd be like, this is kind of stupid. Like, I, like, like I'd rather have a different reward than being paraded around the city because you know what? Someone who has a right heart and a right humble attitude, you're not looking for glory and fame and just everybody looking at you and, oh, wow, look, he's on the king's horse. It doesn't matter to you. It's people who are already full of themselves and full of pride and conceited and they want everybody looking at them and everything to be about them. They're the ones that love that stuff. Mordecai doesn't care. He's not looking for that type of recognition. He'd probably rather get, you know, a paycheck or something. Be like, hey, good job. Here's a little bonus, right? Be like, okay, cool. That could go, that could go a little bit longer than just being paraded around. Um, although it, it's, he must have gotten the satisfaction, at least, of knowing that Haman hated him so. Now to have Haman leading him around. So at least he got that satisfaction because he wouldn't bow down to him. And here's the thing. I think that also demonstrates how, you know, when you refuse to bow down and refuse to do what's wrong, God will lift you up and God will exalt you and God will save you and God is capable fully of turning tables like he did here. Verse number 11, the Bible says, Then took Haman the apparel and the horse and arrayed Mordecai, and brought him on horse, horseback through the, through the street of the city and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor. Now this is me adding my own personal opinion to this, but I can imagine he's probably going, Thus shall it be done to him whom the king delighteth to honor. You know? <laughs> he's got, he can't be happy about it. right? But he's, he's doing it, so he's fulfilling this role. He's completely humiliated in front of everybody. 
that now you've got Mordecai the Jew up on this horse wearing a king's apparel and he's down leading the horse around. Right? He's in that humble position. And I'm, I'm going to read this for you. Turn, if you would, to Matthew 23. Matthew 23. I'm going to read you from Psalm 37. We went over this in our Psalm series, but Psalm 37, verse 34, the Bible says, Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. We need to learn to wait on the Lord. Have the patience to wait on God. Wait on His timing. We, we're in the midst of, of February, which is our prayer challenge month. We do a lot of praying. As we pray, as we make our petitions known unto God, as we ask for things, remember that He doesn't always respond when you want Him to respond. Not, it doesn't always happen that way. But have the faith and the patience to know, one, that God is good. Okay, God is good. And he hears his children's request. And when you're doing what's right, you have integrity of heart, there's no reason he's not going to hear you. Now, he may not decide to answer you the way that you think he should at the time that you think that he should. But he will answer you. Just like he sees all the work that you do as a servant, it may not happen right away. You may not get that blessing right away, but it will come. It'll come later. He'll make sure that it happens. And you know what? Whenever it happens, you're going to be glad God did things the way that he did, when he did it, because it's better than what you would have thought. We have short-sightedness, and it's natural. We don't know the end of everything you know, of, of every detail, of every aspect of our life, like God does. God knows what things are coming ahead of us in the future. So whereas we might be freaking out about something right now and going, oh man, you got to change this or do this. By God not interfering at that moment could actually help you in some other way that's unknown to you at the time that you're going through that. Which is why we need to have the patience and faith and have the comfort of knowing, hey, God knows all things. So if he's not doing what I expect him to do right now, you know what? There's probably a reason for that. There's probably a purpose for that. I don't know what it is. We don't have to know what it is. That's why it's called faith. Because you don't know exactly what it is at any given moment. But we need to keep our trust in him. No matter what's going on, even, you know, in, in, you know, with Mordecai, with Esther, we don't know how everything's going to play out. Esther had no idea how things were going to play out for her when the king's recruiting all these virgins of the land to come onto the, onto the palace. She ended up becoming queen. Joseph definitely had no idea how things were going to play out. And I brought this up in the past. He's just a good example of the same type of a story illustration he had no idea things were going to play out when he was sold into slavery, sold into bondage, you know, or when he was arrested because he was falsely accused and cast into prison. He had no idea how things were going to play out. But you know what? He, he, he maintained the course. He served the Lord in every capacity, no matter what state he was in, whether he was abased and in prison and, and, and disregarded by everybody or whether he was exalted and lifted up into a position being number two in charge. He maintained the course to do what's right. And that's what we need to do, whether we're, we are bound or whether we're based, to serve the Lord. I had you turn to um, Matthew 23, look at verse number 11. And this is Jesus Christ explaining, hey, if you want to be great, you want to be great in God's eyes, you want to be the greatest child of God, you want to be the greatest disciple, you want to be the greatest person, you know, for the Lord. The Bible says in verse 11, but he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. You want to be great? Learn how to serve. You want God to exalt you and, and you to be lifted up and have all this greatness? Learn how to serve other people. Get the mindset that it's not all about you. Because the best way to receive honor, to receive glory, to receive credit 
is by having other people bestow it on you instead of you trying to take it for yourself. Well, I deserve this because I did everything. That's phony. That's fake credit. That's fake glory. And no one's going to respect you for that. No one's going to care about that when you just think you could take it all on yourself. But when other people can recognize and say, oh, wow, hey, Brother Peter's doing this great job over here. He's doing this. He's doing that. When someone else is saying that of you and when other people are doing that, that's real credit. That's real glory. That's real honor. That's real praise. But you're not going to get that when you're self-willed and you make everything all about yourself. No one's going to esteem you for that. And especially not God. And if you want the best glory and the best praise and the best honor, you want that honor coming from God, you want God to be able to show and, and recognize what you've done, have the, the, the attitude and the mindset that Jesus Christ had. Jesus Christ came to minister, not to be ministered unto. Jesus Christ came to be a servant. Jesus Christ came to offer up himself a sacrifice for many. Jesus Christ came and humbled himself to be the servant to show us how we ought to live. Now, he was the son of God. Who is more deserving of glory and praise and honor than Jesus Christ, right? King of kings and Lord of lords. Deserving of any credit, deserving of all honor, deserving of all majesty, yet he still humbled himself and served the creation. He served the creature. He served people. He served human beings. Right. And said, this is how you do it. If I can do this, you can do this. As Philippians says, you know, we need to have that mind of Christ, esteeming others better than ourselves. And you know what? You esteem other better than yourself no matter what state you're in. And this is a huge problem with the world today. Okay, the world. We have way too many people saying, I need this and I need this handout and you need to give this to me and the government needs to give this to me and you have so much and I have so little and you need to give all this stuff to me. And the Bible says you need to esteem other better than yourself. We're not to be a respecter of persons. Whether someone comes in and has all kinds of money and it shows and they're wearing the fancy stuff or whether someone comes in and they have nothing and they're poor and they're tattered. You know what? We treat everybody the same way and we're going to be humble and we're going to esteem other better than ourselves. And if someone's going to gain in a situation where you or me, it's going to be you. But see, we all have to have that mindset of thinking, you know what? We're going to help other people. Someone's in need. We're going to help them. I'm going to see them. Hey, I might need to sacrifice something here to help them out. That's at the heart of Christianity. Jesus, our Savior, what did he do? He made the biggest sacrifice he could, his own life. That's right. He laid down his life for us. And we don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. We got to get rid of this attitude that thinks, oh, I deserve this and I deserve that. You don't deserve anything. I don't deserve anything. I'm a sinner. I deserve hell. I don't deserve it. But thank God, God's so loving and merciful that one, he saved my soul from hell because Jesus Christ paid the price. Well, he died on the cross and rose again and, and offered up that free gift. And then number two, on top of that, God is still so loving and merciful and generous that the Bible says, hey, if we work for him, if we humble ourselves, if we serve others, God will exalt you. God will make you great. God will bless you. God will do things for you that you don't even deserve. But we got to maintain that right heart, that, that right attitude. Verse 11, Matthew 23, But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. The base means you're going to be brought low. You want to exalt yourself? You think you're that great? God's going to bring you down, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. You make yourself of no reputation. That's what Jesus Christ said. He was of no reputation. He was born into a humble home. Hey, he could have been born into any family he wanted to. 
Right? I mean, God could choose, hey, wh who's, who is he going to be born unto? He could have been born unto, you know, the king's household and been have all this privilege and everything else. He was born in a family where Joseph was a carpenter. Simple guy, simple man, right? I mean, basic, hardworking guy, just working with his hands, doing, you know, doing regular labor. Nothing fancy, nothing rich. Jesus did more for mankind than anyone in the whole world. If he could have a humble beginning and have so much success, what can you do? Depends on your attitude. It depends on your mindset. You're going to go around thinking it's all about you and what can you give me and what can you do for me or you're going to go around going, what can I do for you? You start serving others, God will take care of you. That's how God works. He's not going to, he is not going to suffer you to be in need. That's why the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. You're seeking the kingdom of God. You're thinking about what does God want me to do? What, what's the right thing to do? Serve the Lord. Serve the Lord with all your heart. Serve the Lord fervently. Do his will. Serve other people. He's going to take care of you. He's going to take care of you. And when, and when in that verse, in the context, all these things shall be added unto you, the questioning was about food and clothing. And he's saying, don't worry about that stuff. You don't have to worry about that stuff. Because God will clothe you. God will feed you. You seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things should be added unto you. But you know what that's about? That's about meeting your needs. Not all of your lustful desires to be rich and have all the world's goods. God's not promising you that. Because you know what? That's not even good for you anyways. It's not. People just have all these riches. They get consumed by those things. They end up turning greedy and wanting more and more. Not every single person, but you know what? By and large, it's a curse. And you'd be like, Pastor Burzins, what do you mean it's a curse? I, I, I had all that, you know. There's a reason why people who don't have very much money end up, who end up winning the lottery and they get all this fortune and write all this money, end up just losing it all and going right back to where they were in a very short period of time. And it's not, it's not worth it. It's all empty anyways. The only reason you think there's something so great to it is because you don't have it. And you're building it up to be something more than it actually is because then once you finally get here, you're going to be like, oh, this is all it is? People covet, oh man, those fan, the newest iPhone. Oh man, it's got six, it's got 25 cameras. <laughs> That's all they do these days, right? Is add cameras. It's like, it's got cameras like everywhere you turn the thing. It's, it's awesome. And then you get it and you, and you play with it for a week and you try to figure it out and whatever and it's like, after about a week or two, you're throwing it around. And, eh, okay, that's cool, whatever. Yeah. It's old news. Yeah. It's empty. But for so long, you're, oh man, my, I got to have that thing. And if I just had this, and if I just had that, it's never going to satisfy you. When you're looking at physical things, you're looking at the world's good, you're looking at money, it's never going to satisfy you. Right. It's never enough. I'll tell you what, I've, I've grown a lot just in general over the years that, that I've lived on this earth and have, have made a variety of different wages and salaries and things just over time and, and working. And you know what I've found? No matter how much I've ever made, it's never enough. <laughs> in my mind. Now, honestly, it is, it's always enough. It's always enough. No matter what I'm making, it's always enough. But in your fleshly desires, it's never enough. It could be like, oh man, yeah, I finally got to this point. Yeah, this is what I needed. This is what I wanted. And you realize, no, I actually want a little bit more. No, I we, need to, we need to kill that and fight that flesh. Fight that, fight that fleshly attitude. Because you're going to be consumed by that. And you're not going to find peace. You're not going to find comfort. You're not going to find joy. You're not. You think you will and you won't. 
It's going to be an empty pursuit, and you're going to realize after however long it takes you to realize, man, I've been spending all my time going after this filthy lucre, and it's empty. I could have been doing something great with my time. And I'll tell you this much, when you serve God and your eyes are, are focused on the things of God in heaven, the rewards that God give you are eternal. Amen. Eternal means it, it lasts forever. There is an inheritance that's already waiting for us in heaven, an inheritance where the streets are paved with gold. The gates have these great pearls and ornate and beautiful and everything way better than anyone this world could ever do or, or have. And it's like nothing in heaven. Why focus so much on gaining the wealth that you may, you may die tomorrow and that's all just going to go away. It's going to waste away. And it's going to be useless for you but if you spent your time serving the Lord, serving the Lord faithfully, serving the Lord humbly, not getting everything that you think you deserve. Oh man, I've been, I've been doing this and I've been doing that. You know what? Wait on the Lord. Because this short period of time that we have on this earth, these few years or decades or whatever we have here, is it doesn't even show up on the timeline of eternity. It's too small. I mean, think about it. it. You're looking at a scale, right? We all see the little charts, and you've got a little line, and you've got your years, right? You look at history. The bigger, the, mo the more amount of time you have on that, on that chart, the much smaller every single year becomes. So if you start from here, this is year zero, and this goes to year 10. Well, you've got quite a bit of time to fit things in between here. One year, two years, three years, four years, right? But let's say this is year zero and this is year a thousand. Well, now you've got a lot less space here. You've got you to try to figure out. You're not going to... There's One year is not very much. Now make that a million. Now make that ten million. Now make that a billion. Now make that just eternal. It just goes on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. One little segment of that time, which is ultimately what we have here, which is the Bible, Bible says that our life is a vapor. I mean, a vapor just appears and disappears almost in the same instant. You see the vapor, gone. You go outside, breathe a breath, and the cold air goes away. That's what our life is like here. It's so short. Now, it may not feel that way for us, but we need to get the right perspective on things. Or you feel like, oh man, things are so difficult. I don't know how I can make it through this. I don't, you know, all the things that we deal with, take a step back and think about in the grand scheme of things and reevaluate and say, okay, here's where I'm at right now, but this is what God has for me. Am I going to focus on that little tiny piece of segment and doing everything I can to have the best life I can right here and make as much money and have all the conveniences and all this other stuff here? Or am I going to try to make all of eternity that much better and have that retirement plan of rewards laid up in heaven that God's going to give me for serving him here in this lifetime. It's a no-brainer of what we should do. But we got to battle the flesh because the flesh wants you to do things for now. The flesh wants you to do things for today. God wants you to do things for eternity. Amen. And if we want to be great in God's eyes, you know what? We need to humble ourselves. We need to be a servant. Mordecai was a servant. He was a good servant. Mordecai shows us how to work hard and, and how to just, you know what? You don't get recognized for something? It's okay. I'm still going to do what's right. Let's close up here in Esther chapter 6, look at verse number 12. The Bible says, And Mordecai came again to the king's gate. So Mordecai goes back to work, right? Because that's where he was, he was at the gates, right? That was his job. He was, he was kind of watching the gates. He's sitting at the gates. And he goes back to the king's gate. Right? So they, they prayed him around. He's like, okay, yeah, that was cool, great. I'm going back to work. Right? He didn't, he didn't go and be like, oh, man, i got to have this party and let everybody know now all my friends and call my wife and, you know, and tell them like, like Haman did. 
Right? He had to tell him, oh, I got invited to this, this banquet. Let me tell you how great I am. Mordecai goes back to work. Mordecai came again to the king's gate, but Haman hasted to his house mourning and having his head covered. He's ashamed. He's definitely ashamed. And look at verse 13 and 14 is interesting. The Bible says, And Haman told Zeresh his wife and all his friends everything that had befallen him. So he tells them the whole story, right? Oh man, you're not going to believe this. Then said his wise men and Zeresh his wife unto him, If Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews before whom thou hast begun to fall, and it's true, he's begun to fall. This is just the very beginning. Thou shalt not prevail against him, but shalt surely fall before him. And while they were yet talking with him, came the king's chamberlains and hasted to bring Haman unto the banquet that Esther had prepared. This is the beginning of the fall. But what's interesting about this, look at chapter 5. We saw this last week. Look at chapter 5, verse 13. The Bible says, Yet all this availeth me nothing, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. So notice how he says in verse 13, Mordecai the Jew. And what do they say in verse 13 of chapter 6? If Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews, you knew he was the seed of the Jews yesterday when, when Haman came unto you and said, Mordecai the Jew. And, but what did they advise him yesterday? In verse 14 of chapter 5, Then said Zeresh his wife and all his friends unto him, Let a gallows be made of fifty cubits high, and tomorrow speak thou unto the king, that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. And just go ahead and be merry and everything else. His own wife and friends advised him one day prior, Oh yeah, just build a gallows, have him killed, go talk to the king about it, you'll be just fine. The next day, they're saying, oh, well, I mean, if he's a Jew, of course, I mean, you're just going to be destroyed now. You've just begun to fall before him. Pfft, how do you not know that? They don't care about him. These people that are full of themselves, these people have all this pride, and they, surround, they have all these friends, right? All the celebrities, the Hollywood, the musicians, they have all these friends, right? You think they're real friends? You know what they care about? That's right. Money. They think if I spend enough time, I could tell this person what they want to hear and they'll want to have me around because I'm only going to say good, nice, positive things to them. They're not their friend. They didn't warn him about the Jew before making the gallows. They just said after the fact, oh yeah, I mean, well, of course. They don't care about him at all. So yeah, you think, oh, I'm going to be so famous and everyone's going to love me and I'm going to try to do everything I can to just get all this fame and attention and glory and honor. And it's all going to be fake. It's all fake. And you know what? That's why the celebrities that get all this fame and all this fortune and all this stuff, that's why... They're not staying together with any person or getting divorced or remarried, divorced, remarried. That's why they're into drugs. That's why they're drunks. That's why they can't be happy because everything they have is empty. That's right. yeah. They put on a front. They put on a facade. They make it look like, oh man, look at me. Look how cool I am. And inside, they're miserable and they hate their life yeah. because it's empty and it's meaningless. And they don't want to let on on that because they don't want to admit it to themselves that their whole life is just fake and empty because that's depressing. So they try to live this, this wave of being full of themselves and conceited and it leads to destruction. And at the end of the day, no one really cares. I mean, there's so many examples, and, and this will show my age a little bit, but uh, I don't know why this popped into my head. But, you know, how people surround themselves with, uh, that want to be around these, these celebrities. Back in the day, who remembers MC Hammer? All right, Hammer, please, Hammer, don't hurt him. Right? Okay, MC Hammer, he wore the baggy pants and he did his fancy dance and stuff, right? I mean, he was like at the top back in the day. Right, I mean, everyone loved MC Hammer. Okay, but what happened to him? Broke. He lost all his money. And you know what? I, he was probably a nice guy. I don't know anything. You know, I don't know him or whatever. But like, he, he was giving money to all these people and stuff. He surrounded himself with all these people. And then he went broke. And then you know what? He lost everybody. All of a sudden, 
all those cousins and all those relatives that wanted to be around him and wanted to be by him and wanted to help him so when everything was going good all gone all of them it was fake they don't care about him they cared about his things they cared about his money and when that money runs out see ya That's why you ought to want to spend your time around people who aren't into that. Because then, whether you have a lot or a little, if you're around people that actually care about you and love you, and they're going to try to help you, and people who love you, people who love you are going to try to help you, even if the things that they say to you might hurt, might sting, might be something you didn't really want to hear, but the person who loves you, if they're trying to help you, are going to tell you the truth. And it may not be pleasant. And it may even potentially cost the friendship. But when someone loves you, they're going to tell you the truth because they want to help you out. And this is the way we operate here. Okay? And people can call us all kinds of names. The world's going to say we're hateful. The world's going to say, oh, you're not loving. You're not Christian. You're not giving and everything else. But you know what I want to do? I want to help people. But helping people doesn't always translate to what the world says help is. Helping people is not telling you, hey, everything's just going to be all right all the time. I help anybody because that's not reality. You're going to be facing different things. You're going to have to go through different things. You're going to be, you know, even if you decide today, you know what, I'm going to live the rest of my life and serve the Lord. Well, you know what? Like Jesus said to the people who came to him, you know, Lord, I'll follow you whithersoever thou goest. He says, you know what? The foxes have dens. The birds of the air have nests. Son of man hath not where to lay his head. I don't even know where I'm sleeping tonight. You want to follow me? It's not going to be comfortable. He loved them, so he told them the truth. Don't expect this to just be some easy walk. It's not just easy street. Now you'll have joy and peace and comfort when you walk in the Spirit. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. But it doesn't mean all your circumstances are just going to be roses. Right. The person who loves you, though, is going to tell you the truth about all that. The person who loves you is going to tell you, you know, fornication is sin, drunkenness is sin. They're going to tell you about this stuff. Be why? Because if you do those things, you're going to be punished of God. If I love you, I don't want you to be punished. So I'm going to tell you about this stuff. I'm going to tell you what God's Word says. I'm going to tell the person who's, who's unwilling to work. You know what the Bible says? If a man's not willing to work, then either should he eat. Hey, you know what's going to help you more than me just giving you a handout and giving you a bunch of money? You know what's going to help you is you working. Amen. Getting right with God. Because God will see you working. He'll see you working hard. Whether you're scrubbing a toilet or writing a computer program, whatever you do, God's going to see you working hard. He'll take care of you. But don't forsake what the Bible says and what God teaches us. I want to help people. And help means, here's what the Bible says. Here's what God's Word says. Well, how much more can I possibly help anyone than directing them to the truth, first and foremost. How did I get off on that? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Mordecai is that great example, right? Mordecai shows us, I don't care if I get the praise, I, you know, I'm still going to do what's right. Let's decide to do what's right because it's right. And, and focus on heavenly things not on earthly things not on the carnal things it's a short time we have here friends and there's a lot of people to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ let's all work together for that goal let's bow our heads have a word of prayer dear heavenly father lord we thank you so much for all the great lessons that we learn in this chapter and I pray that you please help us all to grow in our faith and to not fret and not uh, get anxiety when things get uh, troubled in our life, when we're, when we're faced with obstacles, when we're faced with uh, opposition, when we're faced with just, just trying times and very difficult times, Lord, but that we could maintain 
that, that solid faith that, that we know that, that you will see things through and that, and that all things work together for good to them that love God, to those that are called according to his promise, Lord, that, that we know that, that, hey, we love you, we're serving you, it's going to work out. And we may not see exactly how it's going to work out right now, but help us to, to maintain that, that faith and that confidence in you. Uh, we've trusted you with our souls, so it would be silly not to trust you with everything. Um, help us, Lord. Help us to, uh, to reach. Help us to help others and, and to maintain that humble attitude and that humble mindset where we're going to not be served and not have people serve us, but that we would serve them. And uh, Lord, I want nothing more than that, that attitude and that spirit to permeate this church here, dear Lord, that we can be a church full of servants to help others, especially bringing others to Christ, and that you know, we'll let you do any lifting up and exalting as is, is due, but we're just going to lower our heads, bow our heads, and, and serve you in humility of spirit and humility of mind and, and um, try to follow Jesus as, as best as we can in this world. Lord, help us do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.